Okay, so um, Nav, do you want to do some welcoming remarks again? or Yes, I... welcome everyone to our Zoom eClass student tutorial session today. We're going to be offering this session for students just to give you a glimpse and a quick intro to what Zoom is, what eClass is. And eClass is a portal or a platform that York University uses um, for students and houses all their classes, courses, course material, communication with professors where you'll probably submit a, well, sorry, not probably, you will be submitting assignments that way. Um, well, some of you are doing in person this year, so it's a little different. Um, and so our students uh, who will be presenting the presentation today are Sabina Goranova and Julian Salvador, who are both work study students at the Center for Mature and Part-Time Students in the past year and a half. And so this session is brought to you by them and their experiences um, by using Zoom and eClass. So over to the next slide, please, Julian. So today, uh, since York University is a settler's institution um, or um, on Indigenous land, I recognize that this session is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space. So I would invite you to think about your space in relation to the land that you're currently on. I'd like to remind you that the land acknowledgement acknowledges our history. As this meeting is virtual, we're not gathered in the same place. I just said that, sorry about that. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have long standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge that the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, this territory is subject of the Dish with a One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you. Over to you, Julian. Like I said, our presenters are uh, Sabina and Julian. I'm going to hand it over to Julian to begin, and he can introduce himself. Go ahead, Julian. Thanks, Nav. So um, like Nav said, my name is Julian. Um, I've been uh, uh, working for um, ACPAPS for, I think, this fall is my fourth year with them. So um, I've been a student success mentor lead, helping students out. Um, or various backgrounds. It could be first year students, could be mature students. So um, likewise, for this workshop, I hope to do the same for you folks. Um, I hope our experience, our experiences will be to your benefit. Um, and just to mention, um, in the past sessions, there have been some technical issues, again, just because of the bandwidth and, you know, my computer can't keep up. <laughs> so um, if should anything happen, my colleague Sabina, she'll introduce herself in a bit, will also step in and you know share her screen should anything happen. So just a caveat, um, should anything happen later down the line. So Sabina, um, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Julian, and thanks, Navni. I'm Sabina. I am a fourth year communication studies major. I am a mature student, and I am currently working as a work study student for the um, Atkinson Center for Mature Students. Um, and I'm hoping that we give you a very broad overview of uh, E-Class and Zoom that you'll be needing. And if you have any questions, they should be addressed during the presentation. So just bear with us if we're going section by section. If we still haven't addressed them, then you can ask them in a Q&A. But um, as a speaker, I can't see some of the chat. So it's kind of difficult for me to answer them on the spot. So you know, save, save your question if you can, um, try and remember it, um, or hopefully we will address it during the presentation. So we hope you find it useful. And back to Julian, thank you. Thanks, Sabina. So um, again, for some housekeeping, this is a safe and respectful space for dialogue and learning. We are attentive to security best practices while using Zoom. If the presenters, that's us, um, encounter significant disruptions and or digital safety violations, we will ask guests to log off. So as Sabina said, the chat and Q&A function will be open and available to you throughout the event. So if you do have some pressing questions, um, you know, the keyword there is pressing, urgent, um, please, you know, feel free to chat. Um, we'll try to answer them as we go along. But again, it may be, they, they already may be answered um, later down the line. We welcome your thoughtful questions and input, inappropriate comments that are out of scope or context or that do not align with our community standards may result in a participant's removal from the event. 
Uh, so please keep it civil and respectful in the chat and when you when you do speak. Uh, you may enable live transcription, so that's already enabled, um, but if it's not, just go under live transcription, enable auto transcription uh, via the Zoom interface, as, as I said, at the bottom of your computer screens. So that will just generate subtitles if you don't have access to that yet. So by attending this workshop, you will learn the key functions of Zoom and eClass for online learning at York U. You will also learn how to access Zoom eClass um, and gain a better understanding of York U's current online learning framework. So um, we really emphasize that um, this is for um, online learning framework. Um, and I'm emphasizing that because uh, the university is moving to more blended learning. So it's not only online learning that will be offered come this academic year, but a variety of courses um, deli being delivered through different um, modes. So the way we'll go about it is um, for the Zoom parts, I will be speaking um, ideally. And then if um, when we go to the E-class parts, that will be my, my colleague Sabina. So we'll start with Zoom for York University. Okay, so for this section, we'll answer the questions, what Zoom is, what it's used for in York University, how to use Zoom, at least for the most basic functions, and where you can find your Zoom classes, recordings, materials, evaluations, and such. So basically what Zoom is, is where online lectures will reside, online tutorials, online office hours, online advising appointments. And if you have online presentations and online mentoring sessions to attend and facilitate, um, they all reside in, Zo in Zoom for mm -hmm. online learning. Now, again, I, I keep mentioning online because I wanna stress that um, for online um, activities, that's they, they, resume, they, they reside in Zoom. Now, um, the way that Zoom is used also depends on your instructors and you know the classification of your course and the way you want you you, you might encounter some terminologies like synchronous and asynchronous, and just to um, define those basically synchronous refers to activities and co course components that happen at the same specified time. So these are, for example. Um, live lectures, live Zoom lectures. So when your professor says, hey, we're gonna have a 2.30 to 5.30 live Zoom lecture, they mean that you know everything else is the same with an in-person lecture. The only thing is that it's happening in Zoom. So that's a great example of a synchronous component in the course. Another synchronous component that might happen at the same time would be an online test or evaluation, right? So a professor might say that, hey, there's this e-class test that's going to be happening from, um, I don't know, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Everyone is expected to complete that within that three-hour uh, time frame. So in a sense, it is synchronous because everyone is expected to complete it within that specified time. Um, asynchronous, on the other hand, is, um, of course, self-paced learning. So um, they're happening at your own time. So um, these are in the form, like one example would be pre-recorded lectures. So your professors, your TAs, what they might do is um, they have pre-recorded Zoom lectures that they then upload to eClass and they will tell their class, hey, um, on Mondays, I will be releasing pre-recorded videos that speaks about chapter one to two. And then next week will be chapters three to four. And you as students are responsible to go in on eClass, view those lectures as you would a normal class. And, you know, we will schedule some other time to have Q&As. So that's an example of asynchronous learning because while the, while the professor might upload the lecture video at, a, at, a, at the same time, the access to that lecture video will be up to the students to determine for themselves according to your schedules and your responsibilities. Um, this isn't to say that it's only it's either synchronous or asynchronous because what you will find as you attend more and more of your classes is that a lot of the professors tend to use both components. So as I said, some professors may upload pre-recorded videos, right? So let's say, for example, I had a, a personality psychology course, 
right? So what the professor told me is on Mondays, she will upload pre-recorded videos early in the morning around 11 a.m., right? But that didn't remove the live component or the synchronous component of the class because what she then ended up doing is instead of using the three hour time that's allotted for the course from 2.30 to 5.30, what she said was, okay, in the morning, you can view the, the, the pre-recorded videos at your own time. And then every 2.30 until 3 p.m., we will meet for 30 minutes just to address any live Q questions and answers that you folks might have regarding the material. So that's an example of how professors might opt to use both synchronous and asynchronous components. Okay, so um, pay attention to these terminologies um, that, that I'm uh, specifying here. So of course they come with uh, benefits. Um, asynchronous components have less chance for live engagement, whereas synchronous components may have um, more chances to do just that. So some other terminologies that you might encounter perhaps in your, when you're selecting your courses or you know, you're, you're looking through your syllabus or syllabi it are online, remote and blended learning. So as I did say a while ago, uh, the university is moving to more blended learning. So what that means is essentially is it's no longer only online that we've been doing for the past year, but this coming fall, winter 2021, 2022, especially for fall 2021, Sorry about that. Um, especially for fall 2021, there's going to be more a variety of courses that will be offered through these delivery modes. So for online, um, I like to say purely online just to make sure that I'm not confusing myself with other because remote is also online. But for purely online, these are courses that have no specified meeting times and students are expected through to progress through the course at their own pace. So a good way to think about it is when you see online, O-N-L-N, -N, when you, you're picking your courses, um, these are courses that are purely asynchronous, right? So um, what that means is, you know, it's mostly, if not entirely, you reading eBooks, e-textbooks, and you submitting your uh, assignments online to your professor at a specified deadline. So if it's basically, entirely independent learning. The great thing about it is, again, because it's independent learning, it's your own pace. And so you, you, you don't have to shuffle between different responsibilities as, as much, or I would like to think that. So that's purely online. Now, remote is a little bit more complex because um, this is where some it will really depend on professors how they wish to operate and arrange their courses. So some professors might say, hey, uh, this course is remote. We will have live lectures for three hours from 2.30 to 5.30. And, you know, we will have tests also um, via e-class. While some professors, as I gave an example a while ago, might say, hey, we're going to have remote um, a course. This is a remote course. Uh, we're going to have uh, pre-recorded lectures and you will have a live 30-minute question and answer uh, a portion throughout the week with me. So, um, basically, to differentiate between on purely online and remote courses is that purely online is, you know, there's no specified meeting times and the students are expected to progress through their course at their own pace, whereas remote, um, you may have specified meeting times as a course normally would if it were offered in person in a lecture hall. Okay, so um, remote is where you, well, for all of these, you really want to be able to read your course syllabus because it will outline uh, specifically how your courses are arranged. Now, moving on, courses that are offered through blended learning have online and remote elements with some chances for in-person face-to-face instruction at a specified time and place on campus. Okay, so um, remote, you may have some live Zoom, interaction online it's purely just you submitting assignments but blended takes it a step further and says okay you might have some zoom interaction you might have some you will have some um, online submissions and you know assignments to submit and you will also have in-person instruction um, on a specified place on campus 
Okay, so there's in-person opportunities. So hopefully that's more clear. But again, these um, terminologies may be subject to change. The most important thing that you can take away from these two, these previous two slides is that you want to be able to read your course syllabus. I keep repeating that like a broken record, but it's really true. Read your course syllabus. And then if you have more questions, consult your professor. Okay. Now, um, this is a bonus content. So where can you find these terms? Which of my courses are online, remote, and blended? So first, um, you want to understand the nomenclature, the abbreviations, what they mean. And you can visit this website here. By the way, you'll have access to these slides, so you know you, you wouldn't have to worry about the links. Um, and I'll also post them in the chat later on. So you want to look into the abbreviations via this website. And once you've carefully, um, once you've understood the abbreviations a little bit more, then you want to carefully read the course description provided in the York University Courses website. So when you're picking your courses, there will be a course description. Um, talking about the course specifying, hey, there's an in-person component in this class. There's, this, is, this course is purely online, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to carefully read those before you even enroll, okay? It's, it's, it's a natural thing to do. So um, once enrolled, look into your timetable and double check the courses you are enrolled into. So again, just making sure that you are in the course that you want to in the first place. Um, so if you enrolled into a course with an in-person component, check to see if the timetable indicates a building abbreviation and or a room number. If there is a building abbreviation, visit the timetable abbreviations again and look it up in the campus map and or Google Maps. So you want to go back to this website just to figure out what those abbreviations mean. Um, yeah, and then if you have an in-person course but does not provide a building abbreviation and or room number in your timetable, you may want to do the following. So, you know, wait for your course instructors to share more information, either via a mass email to the class that he or she will be sending out or through their course syllabus. There's that word again. Um, and if you've waited long enough without any information from your course instructor, uh, you can look into the York Atlas for their contact information and email them. Now, I'm going to revisit this, um, just like with everything else later on. There's going to be definitely some questions in the question and answer portion. So no pressure to remember this right now. We'll revisit it again. And again, um, you'll have the slides. So going back to Zoom, um, how do you use Zoom? So it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, mute is to mute or unmute your audio. Uh, stop video allows you to start or stop your video and apply a background if you wish to do so. Um, so recent updates have added the blur background. So I think I'm using it right now. So it's not an image per se, but uh, it just blurs the background that I already have. Uh, participants allows you to view participants and invite participants to join if that permission is granted by the host. And it no longer has the raise hand feature like it used to. It was moved elsewhere. And I'll tell you where it is now. Uh, chat allows you to chat with participants and or facilitators. Um, again, depending on how, uh, what permission is granted. Uh, record, if permitted, allows um, participants to record a meeting or live lecture. Uh, live transcript is for subtitles. Reactions allows you to just put an emoji um, right at the top corner of your face um, if you wanna be expressive. And also now has the, uh, the raise hand feature. So the raise hand feature will be useful um, if, for example, you don't want to show your face, so your camera is turned off, but you still want your professor to know that, hey, I want to participate, so you, you're clicking the raise your hand button. Share screen is, you know, lets you share your screen, just as how I'm doing right now. And then end meeting for all or leave meeting allows you to leave the meeting. Um, be mindful when you do leave a meeting to not click end meeting for all because that will end everything on behalf of your professor. You don't want to do that um, when the class is going on. So um, video background. So you can change your background by clicking the set um, on settings once you've downloaded the Zoom app. We'll go, we'll go about how to do that in a bit. Um, and then from settings, you can then click at your face, so your profile at the top right corner. 
And then from here, you can click settings. From settings, this dialog box will appear. You can click background and filters. However, if you haven't uploaded any image yet, you can do that by clicking the add button here and it will open up your files from, from where you can um, select specific pictures that you wanna use as your background. And then once you've uploaded that to Zoom, you can just click it and apply it as your background. Now, another thing is breakout rooms. So this is a bonus content again. Um, breakout rooms are basically mini Zoom rooms. So right now we have 100. Your slide is frozen on the video background slide still. Oops. Maybe it's doing it again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's doing it again, Sabina. So um, I'm going to stop sharing for now. So if you could, this is exactly the technical issue that I was talking about a while ago. So please bear with us while we resolve it. I think it's telling me to take a break. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to, I'm going to hop out for a little bit um, and maybe you can share your screen this time around. Apologies for the inconvenience, everyone. Hi everyone, I hope you can see my screen. Let me just, sorry, let me reshare it again. Okay, so as Julian was saying about the uh, breakout rooms, this will be used within maybe your tutorials or bigger lectures where you have the opportunity to be in um, in smaller groups to work on a project perhaps um, and the professor will actually the professor will put you into the groups or you uh, manually or just as, a, as, as an exercise um, so when the professor says it's time to it's time to enter the breakout rooms a pop-up bar will show up here where you, you have to press join um, and once you're in there, you are joining a back, uh, breakout room. And so once you've finished, so um, sorry to go back to the last slide about the breakout rooms, once your session is over, um, you will be taken back to the main room. And it's important if your lecture is still going on to um, select the option that makes you go back to the main session rather than leave the meeting. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have to rejoin the meeting again. And sometimes the professor might not see you trying to rejoin. And being in the waiting room in the middle of a big lecture is quite challenging. Oh, is Julian back? Hello. <laughs> Apologies for that. Okay, so. Sharing or? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share my screen again. I think it should be good for a little while. Yep. Um, okay. Please let me know if you can see the presentation view. Yes. Okay. Let me go back to. Oh. Okay. Yes, so, um, okay, so Sabina covered the uh, breakout rooms. Thanks, Sabina, for covering. Um, so here is another bonus. So this is share screen. This, is, this allows you to, when you're, whenever you're presenting some content, um, of course, to share your screen. And this is what a dialog box will look like whenever you're about to share a screen. So you either have the option to share your entire desktop, in which case ev everything that's going on in your desktop will, will be shown to the audience, or you can share a specified window. So for example, if your Mozilla Firefox is running and you wanna share just that window, then that's an option, okay? So you can just select them. Um, however, when you're sharing a video and you wanna make sure that everyone hears the audio from that video, you wanna be able to, uh, you wanna click share computer sound, otherwise, uh, the audience will not be able to hear what's going on in that um, video. 
So that covers um, what Zoom is, how it's used for in your queue, and how to use Zoom. Now, the next question, the next question that might emerge is where you can find your Zoom classes, your recordings, et cetera. So that is where um, eClass comes in, and I'm going to pass it on to Sabina to cover that topic for us. Thanks again, Sabina, for covering. That's okay. Thanks, Julian. Um, so eClass, um, I had a, a few questions already in the chat and some direct. Um, hopefully this section will address some of those. Um, we also have another, another section on eClass. Um, and after that, if you still have any burning questions, like just like to remind you, please try and leave them till the end, just so we can address them uh, properly. Um, so eClass. What is it used for? So your eClass is the platform that York University uses for course evaluations and your course materials. So once you have enrolled onto your classes, you will go onto eClass uh, to access your particular course. Um, all your courses will be displayed on there. Next slide, please. The course materials um, covered on each e-class on each of your subjects you will have lecture slides and recording depending on you know whether you have what, whatever format you're taking um, zoom class links if you have online class components um, and you also have your test and your text links from the professors they might upload some readings some um, literature then and then you will also have your grades so the most important is in the middle in the red as julian pointed out before your most important and the first thing you should look at when you do log on to eclass is your syllabi the syllabus is your best friend uh, for each course because that will show you the expectations the grade breakdown of your assessments um, your timetable for if you have blended learning for example it will show you you know, you have a live lecture um, or um, a Zoom lecture, and then you have um, an in-person tutorials, depending on what section you're in. Um, this will all be on your syllabus or at the top of your e-class. So um, the next few slides will be showing our examples of, this is Julian's dashboard for some of his courses. Um, and if you look on the this will be this is what you will kind of see depending on what courses you're doing um, when you click on one of them so yeah for example this one um, is for one of julian's courses you can see you can see it kind of lists first of all the assessments you can see the policies from the professor you can see the course syllabus um, it's very clearly clearly marked and then um, this will cover this later then the course schedule this might be you know the topics that you cover each week um, and some of them might be linked to the course readings to um, a more detailed breakdown um, and then another and then the third bit um, that you will be able to see is obviously the zoom link um, so if you do have a kind of you know this for example is right live small group discussion so you would have a set time for these discussions as you can see so it's just important to read the instructions so you make sure you log on in time for 2 30 because you only have half an hour um, and this is obviously something the professor has arranged um, and this is just this is just for um depending on the course that you're doing if you don't have in-person tutorials uh, for example, this is kind of a zoom in of one of the weeks, so this is for um, an online lecture, so uh, the professor would have recorded a video, and then he would set an assignment, for example, the forum uh, where you have to answer questions depending on what they've asked. Um, and then you can see there's chapter two um, lecture slides and chapter three lecture slides, this is just like being in the live lecture but he's uploaded or she's uploaded them up um, onto eClass. Um, and next slide, please. This is an example of, this is just, a, some professors will be very visual in how they make their class look. So you might have something like this, which you can see 
Um, this is one of Julian's uh, courses, but you can see um, along the bottom, you will have different chapters, different sections, but they're just, just presented in this way. So when you click onto it, you have, you have all of them. Um, okay, and then this is basically, um, it will show you what courses you what courses you're on um this is for one of his modules again and again it it just looks different but the content is essentially the same um, yeah so i just want to hop in there so um many of you might be feeling like oh crap there's a lot going on here but when we're showing you these examples of e-class it's not to overwhelm you or anything like that it's just to show you that professors depending on your instructors might arrange their content differently and this how differently is you know some professors might do it like the first example some might do the second example and some might do it like the third example so um just showing you different examples um okay sure uh next slide okay so um one of the things that you will be able to see um is the grades the grades for each of your courses so as you progress through the course you will see a progress of how you know how many assignments you have left, um, and as you as the professor uploads, if you have a quiz or if something else, the grades will be reflected. However, the caveat is that sometimes the grades are um, some professors don't upload all the grades uh, to to eClass. Um, this doesn't mean that you don't have a grade. Um, it could be that the professor has another arrangement, such as sending you. Um, the annotated essay back with the grade on them. The, your final grade will always be after the final exam time, and it will always go to the registrar, who will then put it, uh, approve it, and it will be reflected on my online services at York University. Um, again, this is a link that you will get as part of the in the PDF, so you don't need to remember this. So it's just uh, important to remember that when you do have your grades, it's um, on in the dashboard under your course, you, you can see it's highlighted on the right hand corner where it says dashboard and then grades. And then you get, you see the list of all your courses and you, in most cases you will see a grade on there, but in some cases it's just not, it's not kept as up to date as the registrar's records would be. So. Don't panic if you don't see some grades there. You can always reach out to your professor. Um, and then the, the last thing that this uh, E-class is designed is for course evaluation. So prior to the pandemic, a lot of, um, you know, the, uh, the exams were almost always in person where, you know, whether you're in the lecture or in a small tutorial or in the big hall sitting in the exam. So now um, a lot of, because of this blended kind of format of learning, the course evaluations are much more um, online. They could take place um, as discussion forums, as assignments, or as tests or quizzes. So let's look at the discussion forums first. So again, if you refer to your syllabus for your particular course, when it's uploaded, the, the professor will say, your contribution to the discussion forums will count towards your grade. So it could be 10% of the final grade will be how well you've participated um, in, in a forum by posting your thoughts on the readings or discussions on the topic. So um, if you have live attendance and then the tutorial discussions, this it will show up as 10% for forums and 10% live participation. Again, live participation could be on Zoom where you're attending a Zoom lecture and the professor will take notes of who, you know, who's raised um, questions, who's, who's kind of um, discussed issues there during the lecture. Um, so when you are posting onto a discussion forum, it's really important to ensure that you are subscribed to the discussion post um, so that you don't miss any replies to your threads. Um, because sometimes it's not automatically subscribed. Um, here's an example of a discussion post. So this will clearly say group discussion for week two. Um, and then, you know, uh, this is a question from a professor. And 
you can see you can see the responses um, in some some courses you will find that uh, you cannot see the other participants responses until you have uploaded your own this is simply a way of you know reducing plagiarism um, and also so that you are encouraged to come up with your own ideas um, next uh, this is another example as you can see on the right hand corner and the top and it's highlighted in green. This is what I was saying about um, subscribing to that thread so that you can see the other people's responses or the professor's responses. This is just another visual look of, um, of a forum. Um, and assignments. So under each of your E-class subjects, you will have the assignment title on the course homepage. And there's a little icon that looks like this. It's a little hand-holding paper. Um, the assignment summary page shows you the due dates of all your assignments um, and it gives you the option to add submission. So sometimes these things don't appear until closer to the submission date because the professors choose a slot of when you should submit something within um, which period. Um, you, you basically um, choose a document that you want to upload and you save them you save them under your, you submit them under your assignment, and then you will be able to see what files you've submitted. Um, now to give you a visual example of, um, this is just one of the assignments as an example, you can see that there is four days remaining um, and you can add submission by clicking on that and then add submission. And then you will be able to choose from your, your browser and your um, you submitted there. This might look again. This is just a different look of it. Again, you can click add your document or the PDF, and then you click save changes to add the submission. Now, um, next slide, please. When you can see you've submitted something, you can see it highlighted in green that you've submitted it, um, and you can see how long it, there is time that remaining until the deadline. In some courses, you will have the option to edit the submission if you spot an error or if you decide to add something before the, the deadline. Um, however, again, read your course syllabus or read the notes from the professors because um, some of them say you can only submit it once and once you've submitted, that's it. Um, so just be very, very, uh, very careful. Um, okay. And I know there were a few questions last time round about um, how you submit. Most professors prefer you to submit and Word and PDF. Um, and if you don't already have your own version of Microsoft Office, you can get some uh, free software from York University using your student email account. Um, and this gives you free access for the duration of your studies at York University. Um, again, we'll be sharing this document with you, so you can follow the link on there. Um, you can use it both. Uh, you can use it basically, download it onto your computer, and then use that software. Because most often than not, the Google Google Docs um, are not generally accepted through the submissions. Um, and then tests is basically where you would have. Again, check your syllabus, what test formats you will have. Some professors have a weekly quiz. Some professors will do um, end of semester kind of big test, um, you know, with 30% of your final grade, for example. So often they're multiple choice. Um, and it's basically, as opposed to when you were doing it in person, and it depends on the instructor, how they've set it up, it could be, um, for example, a time limit for 50 minutes. So the most important thing to remember is if the professor says it starts at 9.30 and finishes at 10.30, at 10.30, that's it. It's The system is, is such that um, the actual software closes, the university system closes after that. So if you join half an hour late, you will basically have half an hour to write, to write the same test as everyone else has um, done in one hour. 
So it's really important to um, find out from the professor what the format will be. If you're not sure, you know, ask well in advance um, and make sure you have a stable internet connection. Um, and some of those could be short answers as well. So not just multiple choice. So it does depend on the professor, um, whether they put a specific time and date for your test. And some will say, well, you have between this Monday and next Monday to submit your test, but it will still be a one hour long test. So once you say start quiz, you the time will be ticking down for one hour. Uh, next slide, please. This is just an example. As you can see, on um, it's a multiple choice. Um, you can see on the right side how many questions you have left or how many you have done or which question you're on and the time remaining. Um, so it's important again to check how many questions you, you know, you think you might be on the last one, but you may, may still have a lot of them left. Um, so yeah, it, it's really important just to keep track of that time remaining because it does tick down. So you, you know exactly. And if you don't finish the quiz by the time the clock ticks, it shuts down and it only takes into account um, all the questions that you've submitted um, to date. And also one more thing is important to remember is that some professors, again, they will explain this. They do not allow you to go back to change your answers. So. Again, that's why it's important to read to the syllabus and to listen to the professor's instructions. Thanks, Julie. Next time. Um, and then the academic integrity. Some of you, um, some of you may have come across this before. Academic integrity is basically um, an agreement between the professor um, and the students. Uh, it shows the professor that you understand the compliance with academic integrity. Depending on the professor or the instructor, the integrity, it can range from a contract, which is, or an entire quiz. So um, for example, this is just a contract. So you read it, um, you say, and, it, and it's basically saying that you will not plagiarize work. It will all be your own words. Um, and you agree to it and you press submit. Some of these you will find do not let you access your actual course material until you have agreed to this. So this is like your pledge for, for, the, full, for the full semester, for the full course. Um, another way it could be as a form of a quiz. So this quiz, uh, for example, they, uh, you, you, you go through multiple scenarios and you select your choices and then um, you need to get the highest grade. So until you get to 100%, you can take it as many times as you want um, until you get 100%. And once that's done, it's recorded on your profile and it lets you proceed to the rest of your course material. Um, okay, uh, next slide. This is, for example, this is a, a, um, an example of an integrity quiz. And you can see question six is wrong. So you can go and review question six and what you've answered incorrectly and redo the quiz again. And then hopefully you will have 100% and then you can proceed. Okay. So over back to Julian um, to talk more, um, more about Zoom and then I'll talk more about eClass later. Okay, um, thanks, Sabina. So I know that there's a lot of information thrown at you folks um, in the short span of time. So again, I uh, wanna reiterate that there's no pressure to remember everything that's being said here. Um, it's just to give you a vague general idea so that you're not blindsided when you go into your courses this fall, right? So, you know, because there's a lot of information, we wanna give you an opportunity to take, the, take a breather Perhaps I'm gonna go in, we're gonna go into the chat, uh, just answer a few questions. Again, if we, if we don't answer your questions right away, um, chances are they'll be answered uh, somewhere down the line. Cause I know some of you, many of you have been asking, how do I access Zoom? How do I access eClass? That's actually gonna be in the next section. So um, just bear with us. So CG asks, are all online quizzes or tests multiple choices? No. So Sabina mentioned a while ago that they can also be short answers. 
Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic um, and the online learning, um, many opted to just use um, e-class for multiple choice questions, but um, that has since changed as soon as um, everyone started adapting to the new system. So um, there are, I, I know that from my psychology course, um, my professor did have short answers. I think it was more short answers than it was multiple choice. So again, read your course syllabus. <laughs> um, are synchronous lectures recorded? In essence, the students have the opportunity. So that's a great question again from CG. So um, synchronous lectures can be recorded. That depends on your professor. So I also had a psychology course where the professor opted not to have the le uh, lecture recorded. So for those synchronous lectures, the expectation is that you're in class, right? So because you opted for a synchronous class, just like how an in-person lecture would be, uh, many professors will point that out and say, you know, you're supposed to be here between X time to Y time, right? So, um, however, if you do, uh, if you're not able to make it, you can always opt to ask the professor at your own time by yourself, hey, prof, um, I have this going on. I have, perhaps you have, you may actually have some accessibility issues. So then you can opt in and talk to your professor, can I have an access to the recording of this lecture at some other time? So there is that opportunity, but I do know that it varies from prof to prof, right? Just because it's synchronous lectures um, and it can be recorded doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that they will, okay? Um, just a couple more. Okay. Yeah, so now I'm going to go into um, the next section, which is accessing and downloading Zoom, all right? So for this section, we're going to answer what license and regular account Zoom account is, right? What's the difference and why use license, license Zoom account? And of course, we're going to answer what you need to access the license account and how you do this. So. Basically, the licensed York U Zoom account is this, the Zoom account that has all the access, not all, but mostly if not all, the access privileges for Zoom. And it's paid for through your tuition by being enrolled into York University as a student. So these are the accounts accessed via your York U passport and or your York U email, right? So um, your licensed account, as I said, is part of your tuition and it has the full functionality and when I say more permissions as a registered York U user, what I mean to say by that is some professors might actually have some security features where if you're not using your York U email or your York U passport as a Zoom user, you may not be able to access um, the content, right? Because um, I don't know if you've heard stuff like Zoom bombing. So Zoom bombing isn't really just, you know, when you go into a Zoom lecture like this and then you start doing some malicious stuff, but it can also apply with any um, malicious interference with how things are going in terms of like information sharing. So um, as a way to go around that and make sure that the privacy issues are resolved, um, some professors opt to only allow uh, York University emails to access the content that they're sharing, okay? So that's kind of a, a why license York U account and, you know, do I have a licensed York U account? So you do. If you're enrolled as a York U student, you do have the licensed York U account. So what do you need to access the licensed account? How do you do this? So you will need your York U passport, a two-factor authentication device, a headset or reliable speakers, a webcam, a reliable internet connection, and of course, a good computer. Um, so if you don't have a good computer or any computer for that matter, um, oh, it's important to note that York U does have some laptop lending programs. So you can either borrow it from the York U libraries by going to this link, which also will be shared to the PDF, or you can access it via the York U Better Together um, uh, slash UIT website where, you know, um, so the U Better Together is where you can access all the COVID-19 relevant information as it pertains to the university. And then UIT is our information technology department. So you can also borrow from them. So um, 
We'll leave that for you to read in your own time if you don't have your own computer. Now, assuming you do have your computer, this is how you would download and access Zoom. So you would head into yourq.zoom.us. You would sign in. So as you, at the top right corner, you would sign in using your Passport YorkQ credentials. So your username and password. And then it will prompt you to um, the two-factor authentication device that you have set up. And for that, if you don't have it set up yet, you'll have to add a device. It's again, just to protect for privacy issues against online hackers and, and the like. So um, the way you do that is you add a new device and you'd encounter this. Um, you have to choose which option you'd like, either a push notification or they'll send you a code every time you log in. And you have the option to add a mobile phone, a tablet, or you know, a secure, if you don't have any of those, you might get a security key from the UIT just to um, give you that two-factor authentication benefits as well. That's an example. So if you're entering your phone number um, and then you click continue, and if you don't want to be um, encountering, um, you know, if you don't want to do the two-factor authentication every time that you log in, you can also choose to say, remember me for 30 days. And so you sign in one, you sign in once a month, basically. Just to show you how that would look like for a push notification, this is actually a screenshot of my phone. And so um, basically once you've logged in your username or password, it will send you a push notification and that's what you choose. And then you just have to click approve to your uh, mobile device. So once you've logged in, this is how the interface will look like. So you go to the top um, left menu, you click download Zoom, and you would click download a Zoom client for meetings. Now, you don't have to worry about the 64-bit client, download ARM client. Um, just click the big blue download button, OK? Now, the others here at the bottom, you don't have to worry about those as well. They're just plugins for the different websites that we use as well. So um, you, if you just want to do the application for Zoom, you click the big blue download button. Once you have the Zoom application downloaded, this is how it's going to look like. From here, you want to click sign in. And this is where step four is where a lot of students get confused because they're going to be emailing us saying, hey, what's going on? I, I put my email and whatnot. I can't log in. That's Chances are you've entered your email and then you enter your password and trying to sign in that way. But the way you do it, if you want the license account, is to click sign in with SSO, or in this case, just SSO. What that stands for is single sign-on, right? That means that you are signing in under a particular domain, which leads us to step five. After you click SSO, you'll type in your queue because that will inform Zoom that, hey, this user is part of the York University domain, so they're paid for. So once you've entered your queue, it will ask you again to input your passport your queue credentials and you'll just have to go through that step again. And then it will ask you to open the application. So here you can either just click open and then every time you log in, it will ask you to, this dialog box will pop. Or if you don't want it to pop up, just tick always allow your queue to open uh, this links with the associated app. So you can do either or. Either way, it should launch you to the application as a and it should log you in basically, okay? And this is what your um, uh, your Q Zoom application should look like. So a bonus, um, Zoom routinely updates their software to make it more accessible, more secure, effective, and more efficient. So to check if you have any updates, if you're eligible for any updates, just make sure to go into application under your profile, check for updates. And then if one is available, it will notify you. And then you can just click update and you're good to go. So I'll pass it right back to Sabina for how to access eClass. Thanks, Julian. Um, the chat is very active. So if we don't address your question, um, hopefully listen on because um, hopefully I will be addressing some of the questions in this part of the last part of the presentation. And then we'll have time for a Q&A where you can kind of ask more specific questions if you still haven't heard it. So 
Um, I know there's been a few questions about ECAS, whether you need to actually do anything once you have your passport York. Um, so ECAS navigation. So I'm going to talk about two things. Next, um, that. So what do I need to access my ECAS platform? And then how do I change my email associated with my ECAS account? Uh, so in terms of accessing your ECAS platform, so once you have your Passport York um, and you have your two-factor authentication device, you head to ecas.yorku.ca um, and you log in using your Passport York and with your authentication. Once you logged in, you will be directed to your personal dashboard. So this will be, this is Julian's and it has all the courses on it. Um, and as many of you are asking on the chat right now about uh, your, you don't see any of your e -class, any classes on there, do not worry because a lot of the professors um, are may upload it literally a day before your first day of classes. So considering the university is starting in the middle of the week, if you have a Monday class, it will not be until the following week. So just keep an eye on it. Um, obviously, if it gets to the day of your class and you still haven't heard, um, which would be rare, you need to um, get in touch with your professor. So there are possible issues if you can't access eClass, as someone did ask on the chat, um, they keep getting taken to the dashboard. Um, so you, if it's your first time accessing your eClass, you you can't maybe not see your dashboard straight away. Um, if you have recently just enrolled, then your account, your student account, it may be still being processed. Just give it a few days um, and try again. Um, another reason you may not be able to see your dashboard is if your email address is missing in eClass. So this will be you will be logging on and it takes you back to um, a home page that's not eClass. Um, it will redirect you to a profile page until you actually input your um, email address. So once your email is entered, you'll be sent a confirmation via that email address. Um, and then if you're able to see the dashboard, but there are no courses, like I said, don't worry. I know some of you are panicking. Um, you know, it will be uploaded and in my experience, it's always been, it's always been, you know, a day before some of them are already uploaded. So that's kind of nice because you can get a head start in looking at course material. But again, the first lecture would be the professor talking to you about the expectations, about um, taking any questions. So, um, you know, there, there, there are unlikely to be, you know, major readings or assignments due on the first day. Um, not in my experience anyway. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so how do I change my email associated with my e-class? So uh, from your dashboard, if you go to profile, and you see your name at the top in the right-hand corner, and you go down and you go to profile, and then step two, you would, um, it takes you to edit profile. And then step three, once you, once you click that, it will take you to a page where you can enter your new email address. Um, and again, York University email address is best to use just because it keeps it all in one place and you have more privileges. And um, in terms of using Zoom, again, um, you should be using your York University email. If you enter that, and then once you've done that, it's really important to click update profile because otherwise your information will not be saved. Once you've done that, then you'll be sent confirmation that you have um, access to eClass. So this is like a really key thing. Um, and that's it from us on eClass, I believe. Um, and I'll pass it back to Navani for some closing remarks. Okay, everyone, thank you again. Sorry, it looks like I froze there for a second. Um, thank you again for attending our session today. Thanks to Sabina and Julian for a wonderful presentation. We're going to go into the Q&A. Um, our next session is on Thursday, September the 2nd. So if you would like, it's the same content that we're gonna be offering again. 
However, if you happen to miss anything and you want to come back to that when you're free to register and come to that session once again. We're going to go into the Q&A session right now. And as we go into the gallery, I'm going to ask, oh, Julian has his hand up, um, Julian to stop the recording and then we can go into gallery view. Um, yes, Julian, go ahead. Yeah, so before we actually go into the question and answer now, so I put some resources um, that people might want to, might be interested to look into. So first, the COVID-19 is here. As I said, this is a Better Together website. Anything related to the pandemic and the university will be there, right? Um, next is ACMAPS workshops. So um, this is your the contact information for the Center for Mature and Part-Time Students, their telephone number. So the Mature uh, Services offers workshops for the general population as well as for specific mature students. So from citation workshops, mindful meditation to strategies for shuffling, shuffling parental work and student responsibilities. That's all ACMAPS, okay? Um, and then if you wish to be notified regarding incoming workshops, please email us at ACMAPS at yorku.ca and we will add you to the listserv. Another resource that you might be interested in for tips in terms of online learning, because this was a question from previous sessions, is you know learning skill services. So they're specifically geared towards helping students with regards to academics. So it doesn't matter if it's in person or you want to learn more about tips regarding uh, online learning. They're they're the they're the contact. So. Um, they have workshops that you can sign up for as well regarding time management, reading, note-taking, and more. And just some resources that we got from this presentation. If you want to take a picture of it, fine. But we also have the PDF that we'll be sharing with you um, shortly. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording now. Um, and then you feel free to turn your camera on once the recording has stopped uh, and you can ask and unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Thank you all.